get a lot, as you can imagine, is what did this film mean? <laughs> it's a very common question. And I did recently. When, what, that's how Gary feels about it. <laughs> Having read a, a recent book by Michael Benson, <clears throat> if you want a book that tells you how this film, what it was really like to make, not just to our section, but from the time that Stanley Kubrick decided that, it, that the Sentinel would make a good movie, and he <clears throat> and Arthur C. Clarke got together right up through the release of this movie four or five years later. Get a book by Michael Benson. It's a 400 page book, and I couldn't put it down. I literally could not put it down, and I learned so much about this film that I didn't know anything about. And it's, I think it's called Odyssey, do you remember the name of it? Space Odyssey. Space Odyssey. Just, you know it, okay, it's brilliant. Catchy. But what I want to talk about is that <laughs> it talks about some of the answers that Stanley gave when, when he was questioned about the film, and my favorite, it's very simple, in trying to explain what does this film mean, how do you explain a Beethoven symphony in words? What is there an answer to that question? No, there isn't. Why? Each person who hears a piece of music has their own particular reception to it depending on who they are. We all have a different gut that way. And the perfect illustration of that, you don't have to talk about a Beethoven symphony. <clears throat> The Blue Danube, which is used in the film for the docking of, these <clears throat> of, of the ship at the, the space station, is somebody who had never heard of 2000 on the space siding with the spot, were asked, what does the Blue Danube mean? They would never come up with something to do with space. They would come up with Vienna or something else. So that's true. What this film is, it is a visual symphony that every human being that watches the film has a slightly different response. And the fact that there was a nun at one of the openings in 1968. I was there, you and I, too. Yeah, yeah. and she <laughs> expressed that this is one of the most religious experiences that she had ever had. And yet we've had atheists who are as passionate about this film as she was. So there is no one answer to what this film means. It's your individual response that really is the most valuable part of it. The, uh, the, the, the centrifuge, Sorry. built the centrifuge. I think it was something that weighed 50 tons. It was three stories high. And imagine a, uh, anybody would go on on that. But he had these 50 corporations, including Parker Games, who invented the Monopoly game. They invented a, uh, a, a game to be played for 2001 called Universe. Uh, Stanley shot it with me playing it, then he cut it. It's never used. A lot of things he never used. He built so many things that don't end up in the film, really. Don't end up in any close-ups. And he had so many people working on it. There were scientists that were from the, from NASA that were involved in the design of these things. So uh, when we work, walk, worked on them, when we walked onto the sets. It was something you made Disneyland look sad. I mean, it was extraordinary. <laughs> Every single the set was extraordinary. The monolith, which, as I say, was this huge structure, and imagine a, a Ferris wheel, but with the set built on the inside surfaces of that. So the exterior, like, uh, was quite complicated. It was just lights everywhere, and then the set being built on the inside, and it was built with two halves, like this. Put them together, you get that shot, for example, when Gary's running around boxing. Over and over and over. All, all, many shots when the, when the camera is right in the middle. And um, sometimes we had to lean over and turn our own camera on and then step back and start the shot as it was well. I mean, it, was, it was extraordinary. One of my favorites, seeing people, you know, there are no computer specialized effects, there are no computer generated special effects throughout the whole film. Everything you see in this film was physical, one way or the other. And I just love to talk about, uh, my, Gary will, will add his part. There was this, the monolith, and Gary's up at the top of the wheel eating. Of course, he's upside down. He's got a harness hidden under his costume. And then I enter, 
in the middle of the wheel from a hut. Climb down the ladder, get some food. No, got your food, but you got to the top. Yep. And then I walked up here and sat down next to him, all in one shot. Of course, they revolved Gary down to me, and I just stood in place and walked. But that was typical of how we would do some of the shots. Did you see the blood in my face, Cole? <laughs> I got a small shot. Oh, the other, the other, the other scary shot. The only time that I was really very, very nervous was the where where Hal won't let me back in, so I have to go through the emergency air hatch, uh, airlock, and uh, how that was shot. It looks like I'm blown. You're the audience. It looks like I'm blown weightless back and forth as I end up finally reaching for a lever that allows the oxygen to fill the chamber. How was that shot? Imagine a hole, this ceiling up there, which is the opening of the pod. Parallel next to it, but out of shot of the camera, is a platform. And I'm standing on that, re ready to dive head first toward the camera, which is way down here. There was a circus roustabout who had measured the drop. And he, because there was a rope attached to a, a cable, which was attached to a harness underneath my spacesuit. And, of course, my body was between the camera and uh, where I entered, so you couldn't see that, that cable. But the cable was woven into a rope, so he measured the drop, and then he tied a huge knot. He measured it again the same length and tied a second knot. So on action, and Stanley said action, I dove head first, free fall, toward the camera. I'm going in slow motion, but I was full speed. He waited till the knot reached his gloved hands. He's way up there. As soon as the knot reached his hands, he jumped off and he went hurling toward the ground that went hurling back up to the ceiling again. As soon as the second knot reached his hands, same thing. He let go again, waiting for the second knot, and I went hurling back toward the camera. And that's how that shot was done. Fortunately, we got an extra 50 bucks. We did. <laughs> we got that in one take, thank God. And why couldn't he use a stuntman? Well, if you remember, in my hurry to try to save his life, I have forgotten my home. So they had to use me. And <clears throat> he first was going to work with an actor by the name of Marty Balsam, but then he thought he was too New York. Then he hired a British actor by the name of Nigel Davenport. He was on the set with us for... Hired Marty Balsam, No, he never hired him. He, he auditioned him. Then Nigel Davenport was on the, on the set with us, who is British, very terribly like this, you know, it's all very proper English, you know. And he did all the voices of Al. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't let you in. He only lasted a, a week. Stanley realized, no, it's too British. I'll worry about it in post-production. And in post-production, he hired this extraordinary Canadian actor, Douglas Raines, who, uh, although he's not well known in America, he was the Laurence Olivier of Canada, he did all, was known doing all the great Shakespearean roles in Canada, from Hamlet to King Lear and everything in between. He did the voice of Hal, worked only two days on the film. And uh, anyway, we get back to Stanley saying, he, he said, we'll worry about it in post-production. So he turned to his assistant director, Derek Cracknell, and he said, Derek, you do the voice of Hal for the boys, meaning Gary and I. So for the rest of the film, which was most of the film, this was the voice of Hal. Oh, I'm so I can't do that. It was all like this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like Michael Caine. It was all like this, you know what I mean? Yeah. That was the voice of Hal. That took acting. <laughs> I'm sorry, kid. I can't blow the bloody door. Yeah, I'm sorry, guy. I can't blow the Daisy, Daisy, and we are on such a Was, it, was all the research that he did something that informed him just letting you do you uh, the way that, that he fit you into his narrative? He, he never did his line readings, ever. Uh, I have a theory about great directors. Great, great directors, among all the other things necessary for a film director, or even theater directors, great directors cast greatly. What do we mean by that? If you cast greatly, you don't have to do a lot of directing of performance. 
Well, there were a lot of takes, and he has a reputation for doing lots of takes, mostly for technical reasons. The lighting was so complex, during the make very, very complex. There were scenes where he would take 50 Polaroids, each one of those Polaroids having a slightly different, uh, slightly different lighting. And that happened c constantly, so that meant a lot of takes. Not all of them were, not all the takes, not all the scenes required a lot of takes, but uh, a lot did, and usually for, for, for technical reasons. Was there, was there we did do a lot of takes in one scene, do you recall? Which one? Space plot scene. Which one? Space plot scene, where Hal reads our lips, we did 35 takes. And I, I have to this day, really tried to determine the difference between take 18 and take 29. <laughs> and I have, and I, th I thought, well, either Kubrick is being a total asshole, or, <laughs> sorry, sometimes it's, you gotta use the word, right? And, and he's either being a real dickhead. <laughs> these, these are scientific terms. These are, these are very scientific terms. It was called a, call a, call a fast rally. Yeah. And, he was rather being weird, but or there was some difference. But it, after 35 takes, he let us go, and I never could really figure out what what part of it was BS and what part of it was genius. I, I never. Did. But I, I just love him. Just uh, working with him was such a pleasure always. Oh yeah. He never raised his voice. He was calm. He was open to suggestions. Didn't necessarily mean he would use them, but he was open to them. You never felt you were stepping on his toes. Uh, it was a pleasure every minute. I, I admired this man enormously. Well, I don't know, you may know this if you're fans of, this, of the film, but um, when the film was uh, had its world premiere in Washington and then New York the next night, and then Los Angeles a day or two later, um, the reviews came out and 50% were just bad. They were very, very bad. The, uh, the other 50 were very good, but um, uh, it took a while for this film to take off. MGM was really worried. They even thought they might have to yank the film. So, uh, yeah, it tells you what critics know, right? In the section that we were in, um, it was a, almost a totally visual experience. Oh, I do remember what I was going to say, so I'll get back to that. Um, but one of the longest speeches I had in the film was a communication with mission control. Uh, and uh, it was very difficult to memorize because it was technological gobbledygook. <laughs> and it was like learning a foreign language. So I went over it and over it and over it for weeks and uh, finally memorized it and we shot it. Later on in editing the film, Stanley decided that it was redundant. It was too similar to another scene where it was Mission Control is speaking to us, so he never used it. But, because of the way I've had to memorize it, it's with me to this day. <laughs> and it went like this. <clears throat> right here, and... Mission Control, this is X-Ray Delta 1. At 19020 on board full prediction center, and our 9000 computer show Alpha Echo 35 unit is possible failure within 48 hours. Request check your in-ship system simulator. Also confirm your approval our plan to go EVA and replace Alpha Echo 35 unit prior to failure. Mission Control, this is X-ray Delta 1. Transmission concluded. <laughs>